Hi class, welcome to Introduction to Philosophy. My name is Mike Pancras and I'll be your instructor for the quarter and I'm really excited to be working with you. Uh, what I'm providing here is a recorded lecture that accompanies a PowerPoint presentation and I'll do this every week and focus my lectures partially on providing an overview of the week's reading and, but also discussing ideas that go beyond the week's reading. If you ever have a question about any of my comments, please email me or arrange to meet me on a Tuesday or Thursday when I'll hold office hours uh, on campus by appointment. I'll also post uh, the PowerPoints independently as PDFs um, so you have them to review. The first thing to do in this class is to review the syllabus, which appears as its own module. Um, please read through it all and let me know if you have any questions about the weekly tasks, assignments, discussions, grades, or anything else. Uh, we will have uh, weekly discussion forums where for each forum you are required to respond to the prompt as well as to two classmates over the course of the week. We'll also have reaction papers which are short informal one-page uh, essays we'll have a midterm and a final exam, which are both essays. So there's a lot of writing in the class, and this is a great opportunity to explore philosophical issues and arguments, um, but also to just hone your writing skills. Uh, again, let me know if you have any questions about expectations in the class. Uh, as a note, I'll respond to emails within 24 hours on weekdays and within 48 hours on weekends. So today's lecture is going to cover what we're doing in this class. What are we studying? What is philosophy? Well, philosophy is an English word that has roots in ancient Greek. Philia means love and Sophia means wisdom. So philosophy can be thought of as the love of wisdom. That's kind of a poetic way of uh, putting it that doesn't necessarily give us much insight about what it is that philosophers do. So let's get a bit more detailed in this. Philosophy involves investigating arguments. And when I say argument, I'm not referring to, say, a heated disagreement that you had with a friend or boyfriend, girlfriend, or spouse um, that got intense or emotional. Argument, in this context, refers to any claim that is defended with reasons. And we do this all the time. We always make arguments. And often in friendly conversations. For instance, if I say it's hotter today than it was yesterday, and then defended that claim with support, for instance, temperature readings from today and yesterday, um, I am making an argument. So I have reasons uh, that today was, say, 80 degrees and yesterday was say 75 degrees and I have a conclusion it's hotter today than it was yesterday and put together I have a complete argument well philosophers dig into arguments and they try to understand what kinds of assumptions are going into an argument and whether we can really trust the reasons provided and the conclusion derived from them philosophers ask what kinds of reasons are provided in support of the conclusion are those reasons justified and on what basis? And why are they justified? Why aren't they justified? This analysis of arguments is one thing that philosophers do. They investigate arguments. They also identify and question basic assumptions. And philosophers ask a lot of questions. Critical thinking and philosophy go hand in hand. And critical thinking involves not accepting claims at face value. Rather, we look at claims critically. We demand proof or reasons prior to accepting them. Philosophers are also constantly engaging in dialogue. Philosophy is really an activity. It's people discussing things and challenging each other and trying to grow in knowledge together. Uh, we'll be looking at Plato throughout the class, and he is a very important figure in the history of Western philosophy. All of his writings were in dialogue form, so they read like screenplays with different characters interacting with each other and discussing. His characters, which include Socrates, another important philosopher, 
um, we'll be studying, we're constantly debating topics. Uh, one person would provide a theory and the others would point out contradictions in it with the hope that in the end, a new theory would emerge that was free of contradiction and would arrive at the truth. Philosophers also explore the fundamental questions of life. There are a number of interesting topics in philosophy. One of them that we are all familiar with is ethics. We are always making claims about what is right and wrong, and we're trying to justify our claims. Well, philosophers study ethics. They will ask, if such and such is right, why is it right? Is there a moral rule we should be following that makes it right? Uh, ethics brings up all sorts of questions that people grapple with throughout their lives, um, since we constantly want to do the right thing. But it's not always clear what the right thing is. So here is an example uh, that I'm calling, quote, a simple example. It's an example of an argument someone might make. And I chose it because murdering someone is wrong is something that I think people will think intuitively is true. So philosophers will look at this claim critically and try to figure out what kinds of assumptions go into it. In other words, why should someone accept that murdering someone is wrong is a true statement. Someone might respond and say, well, murder causes pain to someone. That is a reason to accept the conclusion. Now this might mean that on a deeper level, causing pain to others is fundamentally wrong. Now we are moving beyond the specific instance of murder and trying to come up with a more general rule that we should follow in all cases, uh, whether we're talking about murder or lying or hitting and so on. So now we're finding that a more general rule is used to support the idea that murdering someone is wrong is true. Now, when we start making moral rules, broad stroke rules that apply to any number of actions, we are making a deeper assumption that there are moral rules that apply to all people. In ethics, there is a debate about whether moral rules are universal and apply to all people, all cultures, and in all times and places. Uh, some people argue that moral rules are relative. What's true for one person is not necessarily true for another, and both people, in those, that case, are equally right. So this idea that moral rules apply to all people is actually quite controversial, and it's worth debating. Note that how someone responds to this debate will have bearing on whether we can say murdering someone is wrong. Uh, a relativist might argue that it's only wrong if you live in a culture that deems murder to be wrong. If you live in a culture that condones murder, there would be nothing wrong with murder. So you can see how this assumption becomes controversial. So to summarize up to this point, if someone holds that causing pain to others is fundamentally wrong, they are holding a non-relativistic approach to morality. So their claim is deeper than one might think, you know, when they see that argument at a glance. So they are really making a big statement about the nature of morality. Also, an assumption is, that's going into this conclusion is that people are free to not kill one another or to not murder one another. What I'm saying here is that people have free will. We typically don't condemn someone when they couldn't have done otherwise. By saying murdering someone is wrong, you are condemning the murderer, which means you are saying that the murderer could have acted otherwise and chose not to. For instance, if my three-year-old son does something wrong but does it completely out of ignorance, I'll talk to him about what he did but I won't condemn him for it. I won't hold it against him. That's because I wouldn't consider him to have 
been free to do otherwise because he didn't knowingly do what he did. But when we say murdering someone is wrong, we are assigning blame. And so we are making assumptions about the murderer acting freely and knowingly. So these are some assumptions you may not even know are going into your argument, but when you dig into it, you discover them. As you reflect on your arguments, you realize that you are making some basic, important, and often controversial claims about human nature, the nature of reality, the nature of morality, and so on. And another one, killing involves breaking a social contract. Uh, this gets into political philosophy a bit, but a lot of philosophers argue that when people live together in a society, there is an implicit, quote, social contract that everyone agrees to in exchange for social harmony and peace. By arguing that murdering someone is wrong, you might be assuming that such a social contract exists between people and the murderer breaks it, which makes it wrong. So here we find we are making a larger political assumption. So as you see, the seemingly simple argument has a lot of complexity as you start digging in. And there are many other assumptions we could bring up uh, if we keep on digging. But these are some basic assumptions that you may not even know you are assuming. So philosophers are trained to try and bring out some of these deep-seated unconscious assumptions and to test them. Now we can move on to tougher examples such as killing an animal is wrong. Now here's a conclusion that before even getting into the assumptions is already sparking controversy. There are vegetarians and vegans who may agree, while meat eaters would not agree, and uh, or may only agree in some cases. For instance, they might think it applies to the case of pets, like dogs and cats, but not to the case of livestock. That, of course, brings up important questions like, well, why is that? And what are the fundamental differences between a pet and an animal suitable for meat consumption? There are all sorts of complexities spiraling around this example. So philosophers are, of course, very interested in these controversial claims that people make. But really, the process of philosophy leads to the questioning of any kind of argument. So now I'd like to talk a bit about Plato and the allegory of the cave. To reemphasize these presentations will go beyond what our book gets into. Uh, I don't want to just regurgitate the book to you. So this, is, this part of it is meant to add insight and ideas that the book doesn't cover. So beyond watching these lectures, be sure to also do the weekly reading assignment. Uh, my recommendation, uh, as noted in the syllabus, is that you read about 10 pages a day uh, because the weekly readings are uh, 40 to 50 pages and philosophy is tough. There's dense material and ideas that you need to read and reread and think about over time. So it's best to go slowly and let the 10 pages you read each day sit with you and so you can process them. So Plato's not discussed in the first week's chapter, uh, but I'd like to go over him with you. Plato was an ancient Greek philosopher that you may have heard of. If you haven't, no problem, but he's considered... To, by many to be the founder of the Western philosophical tradition. He was a student of Socrates, and Socrates was another famous Greek philosopher who actually never wrote anything down. He walked the streets of Athens, constantly questioning fellow citizens and testing their theories. He was poor, he was ugly, he considered himself the gadfly of Athens, which uh, a gadfly is an annoying bug that never leaves you alone. Uh, Socrates constantly poked and prodded people, just demonstrating to them that their theories had logical inconsistencies and weaknesses, which was, of course, annoying to people who liked to think that they had acquired knowledge and they knew something. In his view, he was helping them by showing them that they don't know as much as they think they know arguing that it's better to understand the limits of your understanding rather than to hold on to false beliefs. 
So Socrates always claimed that he personally knew nothing and that that was his wisdom. Socrates was recognizing that humans are born with a, within a certain society with certain physical features. They're limited to five senses. They're limited in a number of ways that make our understanding of the world also limited. And yet people with egos constantly made grandiose, bold claims about the nature of reality, the nature of mor morality and right and wrong, the nature of justice and so on, all without consistent persuasive reasons. So Socrates tried to help them achieve wisdoms, wisdom by helping them realize that they have a lot to learn. Plato is also a teacher of Aristotle. That's another name you might recognize, and we'll be learning more about him in the other presentation I'm providing to you this week. Plato wrote a lot, and he wrote dialogues. He detailed conversations between different citizens of Athens, and through the, those dialogues, he, he explored ethics, politics, epistemology, which is a fancy word for theories of knowledge, uh, for instance, exploring the limits of human knowledge. He studied metaphysics, which is the nature of reality. Uh, and these are all fields within philosophy that we will be exploring throughout the class. And Alfred North Whitehead, who's a famous philosopher, wrote all of Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato, meaning that Plato covered the breadth of philosophy, and we've been grappling with the questions he raised ever since. Now, we are going to investigate Plato's allegory of the cave. An allegory is a story that is supposed to illuminate some truth to us. And before we get into it, we'll look at different levels uh, or divisions of knowledge or wisdom. With reason at the top, and conjecture being a more basic understanding of the world and, and being at the bottom. Starting from the bottom, Plato thought conjecture was the lowest. Conjecture is an opinion formed on the basis of incomplete information. Conjectures can turn into beliefs. A belief occurs when we accept that an opinion is true. Belief can lead to understanding and understanding involves comprehension of what is actually the case. So going beyond the incomplete information that we just accept, understanding is where we start to grasp what is actually happening and what is true. In other words, the details are getting filled in and we're starting to get it. And then reason is at the top. And this is the ability to explain what you understand. So someone who has developed their reasoning skills is able to defend their arguments and their beliefs to other people. So keep these divisions of the understanding in mind as we go through the allegory of the cave. So now we're going to talk about the allegory of the cave. Uh, and if you're tired of hearing my voice, uh, I would totally understand. And you can just go to this URL and watch a short video. Uh, you can click on the link and uh, if you open up the PDF PowerPoint that I'm providing in the module, and it goes through the story. On this video, I'm going to read the allegory, and I'll also interject some of my own comments uh, in places. So here goes. It starts with um, Socrates talking. And Socrates says, Imagine men in an abode extending down in the earth like a cavern, with an entrance open to the light, as wide as the whole cave. There they have been confined from childhood, their legs and necks so shackled that they cannot change their place or look any way but straight ahead, the chain preventing them from turning their heads around. And imagine their light to be that of a fire at a distance, shining down from behind them, while between the fire and the prisoners goes an elevated roadway, and built along that way, imagine a low wall like the screens which the puppet players have to shield them from the crowd, and over which they show their apparitions. So what we have here is a cave, and prisoners who 
for their whole life have been chained facing a wall, okay? And behind them is a fire and puppeteers. Basically, the fire is, is casting light on what's happening behind them and casting shadows on the wall that they are constrained and forced to look at. So all the prisoners see are shadows on a wall, and that's all they've ever seen. Socrates says, now picture men along this wall who carry articles of every sort that overtop the wall with human figures and shapes of animals done in stone and wood and works of all descriptions. And as you might expect, among the carriers, some are vocal and others silent. So basically he's describing what's going on between the prisoners and the fire and what what's these shadows are coming from. And there's also noises in the cave. So, you know, people aren't just seeing shadows. They're also hearing voices and they're associating those voices and those noises with those shadows. And what we're really looking at here is conjecture, incomplete information. You're seeing shadows, uh, but you don't see what's behind you. All you see are the shadows and the sounds that you connect with those shadows. Glaucon is the person that Socrates is talking to, and he says, You tell of a strange picture and strange prisoners. Socrates says, They are like ourselves. In the first place, do you think that men in such a situation would have seen anything of themselves or of each other save the shadows thrown by the fire upon the face of the cavern opposite to them? And Glaucon says, How could they? If all their life they had been forced to keep their heads unmoved. What about the objects born along the wall, asked Socrates. The case would be the same. And Glaucon says, of course. So Socrates says, so don't you think, if they were able to converse with one another, that when they named the shadows they were looking at, they would take themselves to be referring to the real things. He is now talking about that step from conjecture to belief. So the prisoners can now talk to each other, and all they've, any of them have ever seen is shadows and nothing that's going on behind them. So incomplete information. But now they talk to each other and they start to create a language and start to call the shadows different things. And basically they are creating shared beliefs about those shadows. Socrates says, and suppose the dungeon also had an echo from the side which they were facing. When any of the carriers passed, raised his voice, do you think the prisoners would refer the sound to anything but the moving shadow? And Glaucon says, by heaven, I don't. Socrates says, then certainly, such persons would take the shadows of the manufactured articles to be the sole realities. And Glaucon says, beyond all doubt. So they now have beliefs, and they think that the shadows are all that exist. Socrates says, consider now what would occur if one freed them from their chains and cured them of their folly, supposing that things went naturally with them thus. Suppose that one of them has been released and suddenly forced to stand erect and turn his head and walk with open eyes towards the light. Suppose that all these actions cause him pain and that the dazzling brightness renders him incapable of looking at the objects of which hitherto he saw the shadows. What answer, think you, would he give if anyone told him that all he saw before was empty mockery, but now, being somewhat closer to reality and turned toward things more real, he sees more truly? Above all, what if someone pointed out to him the individual objects as they passed and forced him to respond concerning the identity of each. Don't you think that he would be perplexed and would regard the things he saw before as truer than the ones they show him now? So they've now freed a prisoner and the prisoner has turned and everything that prisoner believed was true and the only truth is getting blown away. He's now starting the process of understanding the world as it actually is. 
Socrates says, and suppose you forced him to look at the light itself. Don't you think that his eyes would ache and he would shrink away and turn again to those things which he can look at and would take these to be really more distant than the objects which were pointed out to him? Yes, said Glaucon. Socrates continues, but suppose that someone forcibly dragged him off up the steep and rough ascent and did not let him go until he had drawn him out of the cave into the light of the sun, would he not be hurt and angered by the process? And when he came to the light, would his eyes not be so full of the glare that he would be incapable of seeing a single one of the things that are now called true? Something important here is that the prisoner who's starting to understand the world and has now reason to doubt everything that he believed before, is uncomfortable, is in pain, and has to be even forced out of the cave uh, because it's comfortable to just believe that the shadows are all that, that that's there. It's uncomfortable to have to totally reshape and rethink and re-understand your whole world. So the very beginning of this process of understanding can be painful. So right now the, the prisoner has been dragged out of the cave and is blinded by the sun. Socrates says, he would have to get accustomed to the light, I fancy, if he were going to behold the things above. At first he would most easily distinguish shadows, then the images of men and other objects reflected in the water, and later the things themselves. Thereafter he could look by night at the objects in the sky and see the firmament itself encountering the light of the stars and moon more readily than the sun and sunlight by day. And Glaucon says, no doubt. Socrates says, last of all, methinks, would come the sun, not its image in the water, nor as Im Im imaged in some alien seat, but he could behold the very sun itself in its own place and contemplate it as it is. Inevitably so, says Glaucon. When the prisoner's eyes have adjusted, it's no longer painful to experience so much light, the, they, the, prisoner, the freed prisoner will then see the sun as it is, which means that he understands the world now. And after all that, he will proceed to inferences about the sun. And this, it is where, which brings about the seasons and the years and governs everything within the realm of what is seen and is the cause somehow of all those things which he and his companions have been used to see. Socrates talks about inferences there. So we are now moving from understanding to reason. Okay, Reason involves making inferences. Now that the person understands the world as it is, that person can start using reason to create theories about how the seasons change, how that's related to the sun. The, he, can, he can build a whole theory around the world as he experiences it. Well now, says Socrates, when he bethinks himself of his original abode and what was wisdom there, and of the men who were his fellow prisoners, don't you fancy that he will congratulate himself upon the change and pity them? And I'm going to stop uh, reading the allegory there. But I think that gives you a great look at that process of moving from conjecture, incomplete information, shadows, to belief, talking with other people and, and accepting incomplete information collectively, to understanding, being freed of your shackles, seeing the world as it really is, understanding the shadows as shadows and not as reality, and finally, reason. Uh, understanding the world as it is and and creating theories and inferences about it and for Socrates the freed person will end up pitying the prisoners because it's best to understand the world as it is rather than to hold false beliefs okay so let's recap some of the important events that happened in the allegory of the cave 
Number one, the prisoners have tunnel vision and see imperfect copies of what is real. They are seeing shadows of what is actually real. As this is all that they've ever seen, they are developing ideas based on incomplete information, which is what conjecture is. And then speaking to one another and recognizing that the shadows are all that anyone has seen, and they form beliefs around them. A belief that the shadows represent reality. Number two, the freed pri prisoner who left the cave was blinded by the sun outside of the cave. This really represents understanding. The prisoner is adjusting his eyes. He's starting to see the sun, which he had no idea even existed. And he's turning around and looking in the cave and seeing what was actually happening in there to him and his friends all along. And I think it's important to note that the prisoner was blinded by the light because that implies it can be a shocking and even painful experience to take philosophical inquiry seriously. Because you might find that you have some beliefs that you just can't defend against a good counterargument. And it might cause you to have to rethink your place in the world. And it might not as well. You might also find that your beliefs stand up to critical scrutiny. Everyone's experience with philosophy is different, but philosophers never stop questioning, never stop researching and thinking critically. So it's a lifelong undertaking that can be quite arduous at times. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. When the prisoner thinks about returning and becoming a prisoner again, or when the freed person thinks about returning to a state of imprisonment, it's truly something that would cause that person suffering. It can be tough to dig so deeply into issues and then return to a group that has a much more superficial understanding of the world and doesn't value the act of thinking philosophically and thinking critically. And there's one philosopher I'm thinking particularly of right now, and that's Friedrich Nietzsche, um, who as a philosopher really became a wanderer and a nomad and, and wrote a lot about the pain of joining what he calls, quote, the herd, uh, which he thought of as uh, collective, uncritical thinkers. And then as far as reason goes, and remember that reason is where we have the ability to explain what we understand. The convincing of other prisoners who take the shadows to be reality would require excellent argumentation using flawless logic. So these are things to think about with regard to the allegory. Uh, feel free to bring any of these ideas up in our discussions uh, or email me questions if you have any. I'd love to further engage uh, with you on these issues. Okay, lastly, let's just talk about some major, major fields in philosophy, which we'll be exploring throughout the class. Metaphysics refers to the nature of reality, existence, personhood, which is a complex issue that is very important when debating some, something like abortion, like uh, when does a fetus become a person endowed with rights, like a right to life? That's a metaphysical question. Uh, metaphysics deals with freedom versus determinism. Uh, are we free to act in ways other than how we're acting right now? Uh, for instance, could you have been doing something other than listening to this lecture right now? Or are forces in play that compel you to listen? Maybe even against your will or without you being aware of it. These are all important metaphysical questions about the nature of existence. Epistemology. I mentioned this term earlier in the lecture, but this is a study of knowledge. What are the limits of knowledge? When are we justified in saying that we know something? Ethics. This is moral philosophy. It's something we all already do. Uh, philosophers just do it in a much more critical, organized, logical, investigative way. Basically, we study uh, what makes an action right, or wrong. And political philosophy. How should people live together? What is social justice? Is there such a thing as social justice? Is it just a social construct or something that exists in nature, like the law of gravity uh, lives in nature? Um, to what degree should we be free to do what we want? And to what degree should we adhere to our obligations as citizens, family members, and so on? 
So these are four major fields in philosophy, and there are others as well. Uh, like I said, we'll be exploring these themes throughout the class. If you have any questions about this lecture, please email me. Also, I'll be on campus every Tuesday and Thursday, and I'd be happy to meet with you in person. Um, you'll just need to set up an appointment with me if you want to do that. I am providing another uh, recorded lecture this week, so please move on to it. And again, uh, contact me right away if you have any questions.